Getting good. Okay. Let's uh, go back to Acts chapter 1 now. And I'm going to read to you. Well, I'm going to talk about one verse as the basis for looking at uh, other things in, in the book of Acts in this session. But I'm going to read you about four verses. Acts 1 and verse 6. It says, So when they met together, they asked him, this is the disciples and Jesus, when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. In other words, it's none of your business. Don't ask the question. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. In other words, these were the very last words Jesus spoke on earth. I'm calling this session the famous last words of Jesus. And I suggest to you they were intentional, they were premeditated, they were purposeful, they were intended to be left ringing in our ears until his return, which is what he had just been talking about. So let me look at this with you this morning, and there are three areas I want to look at, three things in this verse, actually. Uh, we'll look at them one by one. He talks about power. You receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. He talks about purpose. What's that power for? That you will be witnesses. Where are you supposed to be witnesses? He talks about the procedure in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth with an ever-expanding sort of circle. Uh, Jerusalem at the hub, Judea surrounding it, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And we'll talk about these uh, one by one. Let me talk, first of all, then, about what he had to say about power. Verse 8, you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And the question then is, what kind of power is he talking about? There are a couple of words used for power in the New Testament. The word used here is the word dunamis. Now, just from the sound of it, dunamis, you will know it sounds a bit like the English words dynamism, dynamic, dynamite, and they are the source, uh, they have their source in this one word. It means power in the sense of sheer energy and force. There's another kind of power we'll look at in just a moment, but in this verse, he speaks of this dunamis, dynamic power. And if anybody needed power, it was this bunch of 11 apostles to whom Jesus was talking. This conversation took place on the day of Jesus' ascension, which was 40 days after his resurrection. It was a Thursday, and six weeks previously on a Thursday, the night before Jesus was crucified, the disciples had to have their own weakness mercilessly exposed to them. In Matthew 26, you can read this account. I'm going to just summarize to you. Matthew 26, Jesus had celebrated the Passover with the disciples. He had taken some bread at the end of the meal, and he said, uh, this is my body, eat it. In remembrance of me, he took some wine left from the meal, said, this is the blood of the new covenant, drink it in remembrance of me. And so they didn't fully understand what it was about, but they ate the bread, they drank of the wine. And then he said to them this, in Matthew 26, 31, this very night you will all fall away on account of me. All of you. Well, they were indignant. Peter in particular, because Peter replied in verse 33, he said, even if all these fall away on account of you, I mean, I understand 
Some of these others fallen away. Thomas, for instance, I mean, he's always doubting. He'll be gone. Uh, James, I mean, who's James? He'll be gone. Thaddeus, no one's ever heard of Thaddeus. He'll be gone, you know. Even if all these fall away, on account of you, I never will, said Jesus, said, said Peter to Jesus. I mean, you, you've, you've forgotten about me, Jesus. You, you forgot I'm here. I, I, I know about the rest. But I never will. And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times, Peter. And Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Jesus, Peter, Jesus you don't know me, do you? I mean, if I have to die with you, if they have to put four crosses on that hill and stick me on the fourth, don't worry, I'll be there. Now, if you and I were standing around listening, we'd say, wow, this is the kind of guy you need on your team. <laughs> he's strong, he's tough, he's committed. Peter wasn't play-acting. And then it says, and all the other disciples said the same, even Thaddeus, <laughs> who no one's ever heard of. <laughs> Aren't I believe you? And then, as you remember, Jesus was arrested, and it says Peter followed him at a distance. And it says that a servant girl came by and said, aren't you one of his disciples? One of whose disciples? That man they've just arrested. Which man's that? Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of where? Nazareth. No, I don't know him. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I saw you with him before. No, it wasn't me. Somebody looks like me. Phew, got away with that. And then another girl came by and said, uh, aren't you one of his disciples? And it says that Peter swore on oath, I don't know him. I just told somebody else that. Then it says, few went to him and said, aren't you one of his disciples? You've got a northern accent. You come from Galilee. And I can't tell you what Peter said because it censors it in Matthew 26. It simply says, he cursed and swore and denied any knowledge of Christ. In other words, I don't blankety, blankety, blank know the blankety man. <laughs> and suddenly, and Peter was thinking, phew, I got away with that. He suddenly heard, and Peter broke down and wept bitterly it says this is the man three hours earlier I'll never leave you the rest might I won't if, that, if, I have to, if I have to die with you don't worry I'll be there now having denied Jesus three times he's weeping bitterly and the others were no better it says they all forsook him and fled all of them John was the last to leave John stayed by the cross, but he did leave, and Jesus died alone, not a disciple there with him. Four people attended Jesus' funeral. If you put together Matthew's record and Mark's record and John's record, you find the four men in the four people in the funeral, two men, two women, with Joseph of Arimathea, whose tomb it was that Jesus was buried in. He was a member of the Sanhedrin Council. Nicodemus, who's best known for coming to Jesus by night and saying, you know, how come you do the things you do? God must be with you unless you're born again, Nicodemus. You can't enter the kingdom of heaven. That same Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee. He was there. Mary Magdalene was there. And Mary, the mother of Joseph, was there. Four people at his funeral. Not one apostle among them. And the reason was this. They were hiding behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. If anybody needed power, it was these men. If anybody had had their weakness exposed mercilessly, it was these men six weeks before. Now said Jesus, you know your weakness. It's been exposed to you. 
you know your inability to stand by what you even promised you would stand by. But you're going to receive power, dynamic power, dunamis, sheer force and energy. Now, it's very interesting that Jesus used another word for power also just before his ascension when in Matthew 28 and verse 18, it says, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all, some translations, my translation says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Some translations have the word power has been given to me. Therefore, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you to the very end of the age. Now, when he says, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me, he uses a different word for power. It's the word exousia. Yeah, the word exousia. And that means power in the sense of authority which is why some translate authority. It's, it's the power, if you like, that a policeman has when he stands in the middle of the road, puts his hand up, and you stop. If I stand in the middle of the road, put my hand up, I get run over. Because I don't have the authority that the policeman's uniform gives him. This says nothing about his personal energy or dynamism, but about his authority. He might be a wimp at home. He might be henpecked by his wife. But when he puts his uniform on, stands in the street, puts his hand up, he has authority and people stop. Now, that's the nature of this word used here for power, authority. Now, Jesus used both words for power just before his ascension. He used the word exousia about himself. All authority is given to me. That's why in the next verse, he says, I have the right to tell you what to do, and I'm telling you what to do. Go and make disciples of all nations, etc. Because I have been given all authority by my Father, all power, to give you instructions. Along with that, if that's the power he speaks about regarding himself, regarding his disciples, he uses the word dunamis, you receive dynamism, dynamic power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And we need to understand the relationship of these two kinds of power to each other. You see, authority without dynamism is a bit pathetic. Let me illustrate that. The queen is the highest authority in this land. Every act of parliament needs her signature to become law. And the moment the queen puts her pen and ink onto the document and she signs Elizabeth II, is that what she says? Something like that. The moment she has signed it, before the ink is even dry, that is now law. Because she is the highest authority in this country. But although she's the highest authority in the nation, she probably doesn't have a lot of personal dynamic. If I were to meet her on the street, which is unlikely, and say, ding, 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 and mock her, and she gets a bit uptight and attacks me, I think I would have a pretty good chance of beating her, because she is 93. Now, she, has the, she is the highest authority in the land, but authority without dynamism can be a little bit pathetic, which is why when a coup d'etat takes place in some part of the world, when the president, whoever is the controlling power, is driven out of office, he has the authority, but he has no power because he's been driven out by some rebellion that's taken place. On the other hand, dynamism without authority is dangerous. You look at groups like ISIS in the Middle East who have no constitutional authority at all, yet they have stacks of dynamism. And they can close the city down. They can destroy a lot of lives. 
What is needed is for authority and dynamism to come together. The authority to declare what should be, and then the dynamism to make sure it happens. Now Jesus says, I have all the authority to tell you what should be. And you receive the dynamism to make sure it can happen. I'll illustrate this. Uh, many years ago now, I took an overnight bus from Glasgow in Scotland down to London. I've been speaking in Glasgow on a Saturday night event, and I was to speak in, Sunday, in London on the Sunday morning. And the only way to get there was to get this overnight bus. And uh, we left Glasgow, and it was very evident there was a man sitting in this bus who was drunk. He was sitting uh, by himself, there was nobody next to him, but he began to play with the backs of the heads of the people in front of him. <laughs> and they got up and went south somewhere else. Then he slid his hands through the knees, uh, through the seat and played with the knees of the people behind him. And they got up and went and sat somewhere else. Then he decided to sing, which he couldn't do. People got really uptight, went to drive and said to the driver, listen, we can't continue with this man acting like this all night. And so the driver pulled off the main road we were on, in a motorway into a side road, got out of his seat, came up the aisle, said to the man, you're not continuing on this bus in this condition. You've been drinking too much. You can get off the bus right now. You can catch another bus back to Glasgow on the other side of the road, and you can travel when you're sober tomorrow. And the man just sat there and looked out to the window. And the, uh, and, and the driver said, I'm telling you, get off my bus. And the man just looked out to the window, totally ignored him. The rest of us were sitting there saying, what's going to happen next? And uh, he put his hand on the man's shoulder and said, I'm telling you, get off my bus. And the man just shrugged his shoulder and the driver's hand sort of limply fell off. And the man just looked out to the window. The driver went back to his seat, started the bus, went back onto the main road. This man began to sing even louder, thought he'd won a great victory. And a few miles later, we pulled off the road again, drove into a town, and uh, pulled up outside a building, and I, I was sitting on the left side of the bus, and I could see two words over the building, police station. He got out of the bus, the driver got out of the bus, went into the police station. A few moments later, he came back with two big burly Scotsmen, Scots policemen, came on the bus and said, which is he? This guy over here. So one went up and said, all right, get off the bus. The man just looked out of the window. You're the worst for drink, get off the bus. The man just looked out of the window. I'm telling you, get off the bus right now. The man just looked out of the window. The policeman put his hand on the man's shoulder. His fingers sank into his shoulder. He yanked him up onto his feet, swung him around. The other cop got the other side, and the last we saw them going to the police station like this. <laughs> Now, I tell you that because the driver had all the authority to tell that man to get off the bus, but he had none of the dynamic power needed to make it happen. The policeman had both the authority to tell this man what to do, and when he didn't do it, they had the dynamic strength to make sure it happens. And Jesus uses both these words, all authority in heaven has been given to me. I have the right to tell you what to do. But if that's all you know, and you try to do what I tell you to do by your own resources, you'll fall flat on your face like Peter six weeks earlier, who was not joking when he said, I will never leave you. He was serious about that. There's no reason to believe he was pretending. He just then discovered when he was up against it, he didn't have the ability and the strength and the power. Now all authority is given to me but not only that, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, which is going to be 10 days later on the day of Pentecost, which we talk about tonight, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll be equipped and empowered. And Peter, instead of you running off hiding when you're under threat, when you go into Jerusalem, which he was going to do in, by chapter 4, and you're preaching, and they arrest you, 
and they say, that we're going to forbid you to speak any more in this name, you will say, we must obey God rather than men. And you will. Why? Because you will have dynamism you didn't have six weeks ago. The difference is the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And when he comes, he will be your power. You'll receive power. And the dynamism of the Holy Spirit will equip you to live under the authority of Jesus Christ. That's why we should never separate the Lordship of Christ from the enabling and filling of the Holy Spirit. Because it's under his Lordship that we live in the fullness of the Spirit to implement and obey what he tells us to do. So that's the first thing he talked about. <clears throat> he talked about power. The second thing he talked about, oh, sorry, there it is. That's what I just said to you. I'm running ahead of my PowerPoint authority. That dynamism is pathetic. Dynamism without authority is dangerous, like ISIS and other groups. What is needed for them to come together? Authority to tell us what to do, and the dynamism to enable us to do it. Yeah, you knew that, because I told you that just now, but I forgot to put it on the screen. Second thing he talks about here is purpose. He talks about purpose. He says, uh, you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now notice, he doesn't say, and you will do witnessing. You know, that's what you're going to do when you go on outreach or you do on a Friday night or something. But you will be my witnesses. Because if the Holy Spirit lives within us, we don't have a choice. If the Holy Spirit lives within us, we are witnesses. Our lives do say something about Jesus Christ. The question is, are we a good witness or a bad witness? Are we a true witness or a false witness? But we're a witness. When Christ comes to live in a person's life, they are no longer neutral. You're either a bad advertisement for Jesus Christ, you say this doesn't work, this isn't worth having, or you're a good advertisement, you're a witness, a good witness, or a poor witness. I got married right here in this building. And uh, <clears throat> up until the moment I got married, I had a choice. And my choice was, do I want to be a husband or not? Uh, that, that was the choice I had to make. Do I want to be a husband or not? Then we stood in front of this group here, Alan Redpath, who Dylan mentioned last night, who conducted our wedding, said to me, will you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? And I said, I will. Then he said to Hillary, will you take this man to be your off uh, not awfully, lawfully <laughs> wedded husband? And she said, I will. He said, I now pronounce you man and wife. And from that moment, I no longer had the choice, am I going to be a husband or not? I had a different choice. Am I going to be a good husband or a poor one? And I'm a poor one because I keep traveling and running away. <laughs> when Christ comes to live in you, no longer is your choice, will I be a witness or not, but are you a true or a false witness, a good or a bad witness? Because our lives will convey a message about Christ, either a truthful one or a false one. Now, the word used here for witnesses, when he says you'll be witnesses, is the Greek word martyros. Now, that probably rings a bell. What does martyros sound like? <clears throat> Sounds like martyr. Well, that's for a good reason, because the word that we've translated witness here, actually the word martyrus does mean to be a martyr. In fact, in Acts 22, verse 20, the same word is used when it speaks of when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed. It's the same word, witness or martyr. 
What is a martyr? A martyr is someone who dies. And a witness is somebody who dies to their own interest, their own agenda, to their own purpose, in order that the agenda and the purpose of Jesus Christ might be preeminent within them. Now, of course, we all battle with that. But that's the principle. And uh, when you receive power, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be a witness. You will die to your own agenda and you'll allow the agenda of the Lord Jesus Christ to be expressed in you and you will be a witness in the process. But you have to die to the, for that to be true. Take up your cross, said Jesus. If you want to be disciple, take up your cross. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. If you're willing to lose your life, you'll find it. Because if you give your life over to Jesus Christ, he will give his life over to you. You give your life to him, he gives his life to you. And uh, you'll find life in its fullness, he says there. So that is the purpose. Not just so we have power for our own usage in some way, but you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses, my martyros. Then he talked about the procedure. He gives a kind of a itinerary for them, an, an agenda, a schedule. You'll be my witnesses, he says, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Like an ever-expanding circle, Jerusalem was the city where they were. Judea was the province of which Jerusalem was the capital or the state, if you like. Samaria was a new nation. It was over the border. It was a different people. And then he says, to the ends of the earth, there are no limits then. He take the gospel to the globe. Now, let's follow this expanding circle one by one. Jerusalem. This wasn't their home. Their home was Galilee. They'd been in Jerusalem only since Palm Sunday, the week before Jesus was crucified. So they'd been in Jerusalem less than seven weeks. And this had become the place, as I've just said to you, of their most awful failure where Peter had denied him, all the others had fled, one of them had committed suicide, Judas Iscariot. Now says Jesus, you be witness in this place where you have messed up and where you can be absolutely sure when there was local gossip going on about Jesus who had been crucified, they also talked about the disciples who were supposed to be his followers who ran away and hidden and nobody knew where they were anymore. You can be sure that was part of the gossip that went around because of their weakness. It would have been a lot easier if Jesus had said, you'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth and when you've done that and you've got comfortable with that, then you can come back a bit to Samaria and then you can come back a bit to Judea and then when you're really confident and really experienced, then you can come back to Jerusalem where they know you to be a failure and you'll be all right then because you'll be confident. It would be a lot better if he'd said that perhaps. But he says, no, in this very place where you're known as failures, bear witness here. You know, failure doesn't break us. Well, in, in some sense it may do, but it's a healthy brokenness often that God has to bring us to. But brokenness doesn't disqualify us. It qualifies us. Because in our brokenness, we have come to the end of our own resources and our own abilities, and that qualifies us for saying, I know I can't, I know I fail, but possibly he can. And that's going to be the difference. Paul in Romans 7 talks about, you know, in me, that is in my flesh, that dwells no good thing, that is in my natural self. God has to bring us to discover that often. It's often painful, often through our tears, often through experience. We look back and we've made a mess. 
but sometimes it's the best teaching and equipping for us to discover uh, that, uh, that it's in an area of failure that the Spirit of God is going to come and work. As long as we think of Christian living and Christian witnessing in terms of mastering techniques or getting properly trained, we may bypass the deep work of God in our lives that will equip us. All of that is important, to train, to learn techniques such as they are. But Peter, John, James, Matthew, Thomas, Thaddeus, the rest of you, this place where your reputation is at its lowest, where you are full of a sense of shame and failure, this is the very place you have to start. And only in my imagination, but I imagine him saying, Peter, do you remember that girl who asked you if you were my disciple and you denied it? Remember that, Peter? Would you go and find that girl and tell her that you lied to her? That you are my disciple? John, you're the last to leave the cross. You were there when the centurion cried out, surely this was the son of God. John, would you go down to the Roman barracks and look for that man? Would you go and find him and tell him he was right? What he said was true. This was the son of God. James, you saw the Sanhedrin council demand of Pilate the sentence of death. The Sanhedrin didn't have the authority to put him to death, but they could recommend it. Only Pilate, the Roman governor, could put somebody to death. And you saw them recommend that he, they put me to death. And when Pilate said, I find no fault in him, they began to chant, crucify him, crucify him. And this Sanhedrin council, who were behind the crucifixion, James, would you go and visit them? Would you go and meet with this council and tell them what has happened? I've been raised from the dead. Matthew, come over here, Matthew. You're the tax collector, aren't you? You're the guy who used to cheat, steal, as tax collectors did. You saw them offer Barabbas to the crowd a choice. They could either take Barabbas or me. Four, cro four criminals, three crosses, and they, Pilate gave the crowd the opportunity to have either Barabbas released or Christ released. He, from the reading of it, it's very clear he expected them to ask for Christ to be released because Pilate didn't believe in the guilt of Jesus. You can see that reading the narrative. And so he said to the crowd, if you like, you can have Barabbas back on your streets this morning. And they all knew Barabbas. He was a thief and a murderer. When Barabbas was around, people locked their doors. <laughs> when Barabbas was around, the women folks stayed at home. When Barabbas was around, the kids not let out on the street because he was dangerous. You can have this man back on your streets this morning, said Pilate, or you can have this man back on your streets, Jesus. And they knew Jesus. Nobody locked their doors because Jesus was around or kept their kids off the streets or the women stayed home. You can have one of these two back on your streets. Which do you want? And he thought they'd say, we want Christ back on the street. And they began to say, Barabbas. And Pilate began to defend Jesus. Why, he says, what has this man done that is wrong? Why do you want Barabbas released? And they began to chant of Jesus, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And so Barabbas was released. Matthew, you are a bit of a crook yourself. You know the underworld. You know where Barabbas is hanging out. Would you go and find Barabbas? Would you tell him I died twice for him? He knows about one of those times. I died instead of him on Good Friday. Tell him I died for his sin as well. Thomas, you were there and the people mocked and spat on me. 
Would you go and find some of those folks? Look for them down in the city. And when you tell them who I really am, Andrew, those Roman soldiers who play with the dice in my clothes, would you go and find them? They'll be down in the barracks and you'll recognize them because they'll be wearing my clothes. They divided them up between them. And would you tell them when they heard me say from the cross as they divide up my clothes, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Would you tell them I meant it and they're forgiven? They're clean. Because, you see, this was their Jerusalem where they were known for their failure and this was the very place where now they were to begin when the Holy Spirit was empowering them, it'd be much easier to go to Antioch, at least just up the road a bit, and start with a clean sheet of paper. He says, no, you start right here. And your Jerusalem, my Jerusalem, is the place of our failure. That may be here, it may not be here. It may be somewhere back at home. And when you receive the Holy Spirit in power, You'll be witnesses first, he says, in Jerusalem. Then in Judea, which is the province of which Jerusalem was the capital. In other words, now make deliberate excursions to witness in places where you normally wouldn't be. Go and find people. We're going to do that on the 10-day outreach. You're going to go intentionally just to be a witness to people that you otherwise wouldn't meet. And this is right, this is good. And then he says to Samaria, Samaria was hostile territory. It says the Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. The reason goes back 700 years. When the Assyrians occupied the northern kingdom of Israel, and I'm sure you remember this from the walk through the Bible sessions, most of the Jewish folks who lived in Israel were taken off into exile. A few were left behind just to till the ground, keep it tidy, make the land productive, and some Assyrians came to oversee them. And then some of those Assyrians intermarried with some of those Israelites, and they produced children who were neither Israelite nor Assyrian, Gentile. And so as the capital of Israel was Samaria at that stage, they called them Samaritans rejected by the Jews, and didn't belong to the Gentiles. And for 700 years, the Jews have rejected the Samaritans. They had no dealings with them, tells us in John chapter 4. Now says Jesus, go to these folks for, towards whom you've been antagonistic, because the antagonism came mainly from the Jews. Go to these people, cross the cultural boundary, cross the racial boundary, cross the political boundary, cross the sectarian boundary, and be a witness where they least expect it. Because these folks don't think you're their friend. They think you're antagonistic towards them. And it's interesting, the first revival outside of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 8 took place in the city of Samaria. Now, Having gone that far, we'll pause there a moment. There's another circle around that. It took them a long time to act in obedience. Have you ever compared uh, Acts 1.8 with Acts 8.1? Two interesting verses to compare. I'll tell you why. Acts 1.8, as we've just been looking at, says... You receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria until the ends of the earth. That's Acts 1.8. Months, maybe even years, passed by before Acts 8.1 where it says, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Where were they supposed to go? Judea and Samaria. But they didn't go. They stayed back in Jerusalem. It was probably very comfortable in Jerusalem. I mean, if these were the instructions, you receive power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you, be witnesses in Jerusalem. Well, they receive power in Acts chapter 2. They're witnesses in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. They're witnesses in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 4, they're witnesses in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 5, they're witnesses in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 6, they're witnesses in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 7, they're witnesses in Jerusalem. Something's got stuck. <laughs> 
not weeks, months, possibly years have gone by, and they're still in Jerusalem. Well, it was very comfortable to stay in Jerusalem now. 3,000 had come to Christ on the day of Pentecost. Then 5,000 had come to Christ shortly after that. I mean, who wants to leave Jerusalem? You can listen to Peter preach on Sunday morning, John on Sunday night, James lead the youth ministry, Mary Magdalene lead the Sunday school, Mary the mother of Jesus lead the prayer meeting on a Tuesday night, <laughs> Nicodemus do the Bible study, <laughs> Philip oversee the outreach. I mean, who wants to leave Jerusalem? This is a church par excellence, isn't it? Who wants to go to Judea? when we're having such a good time back home. Much less who wants to go to Samaria where there's hostility. So what happens? God disturbs their comfort. One of the best men in the Jerusalem church, a man called Stephen, is stoned to death. And I'm being stoned to death. It then says, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church of Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, yet they were driven to where they were supposed to have gone in the first place. I'm going to do a session on persecution towards the end of this week, just as one of the great themes of the book of Acts. 22 chapters, there's persecution. And I want to just, I'll share with you then how often the most fruitful and growing churches are churches who are facing persecution. And it was true here that having been given their instructions, all authority is given to me, go into all the world, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, authority, uh, ends of the earth, I'll give you, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, power to enable you to do it. But like us, they stalled. Jerusalem, yeah. Chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. It's great being in Jerusalem. What, what, which church do you go to? I'm in the first church of Jerusalem. Oh, really? Who's your pastor? Peter. Really? Who's the youth leader? James. My. Who's on your staff? Mary Magdalene. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Who's the janitor? Thaddeus. <laughs> so suddenly, wham, persecution comes. When their best man dies, Stephen, stoned to death, his body crushed by the stones. Incidentally, it says Stephen looked up and saw Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. He's normally seated on the right hand of the Father. He's standing on the right hand of the Father. And interestingly, when Stephen looked up and saw Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father, Jesus didn't lift a finger to help Stephen. He died from the stones. Because this is going to be the means of pushing people into the obedience, the instruction they were first given. And then after that, to the ends of the earth. Doesn't mean the more obedient you are, the further you'll travel. <laughs> but this is the corporate responsibility of the whole church. That the whole church is taking the whole gospel to the whole world with a missionary vision. One of the things we were concerned about in Toronto and the church that I've been privileged to serve is the way in which we connect with the, the world. And uh, our folks were very, very generous, and we were putting about $3 million every year just into overseas global mission, intentionally, willfully. We had a three-week conference every year, three Sundays, two weeks in between, a global outreach conference in which we brought people from different parts of the world, and we challenged people, and we sent missionaries, and we sent people to engage in all kinds of work, some of them in very difficult places. And we got involved in, in expansion in some of the tough areas of the world, in particular concerned about where the gospel is least known. And it's been such a privilege to see that with the expansion to the ends of the earth, the source, the Jerusalem, the Judea, the Samaria has got stronger, 
Not weaker, it's stronger. And this is the pattern that uh, the Lord Jesus gave in his famous last words, because when he had finished, it says, uh, down there, after he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and the cloud hid him from their sight. Before he could say, any questions? Any problems with this? He was lifted and took off. They were his intentionally last words to be left ringing in the ears of his church. And I ask you, as I ask myself, do we know anything of his power? Are we fully aligned with his purpose? That we're his witnesses. Are we following his procedure, beginning where we are and allowing the gospel to expand from there? Okay, let's pray. And uh, we'll pick this up again this evening. Uh, in Acts chapter 2 and look at the day of Pentecost. Father, we are grateful again this morning that your word, as it stands in this book of Acts, is not just giving us some history. We can look back with curiosity and see how these early years of the church uh, panned out, but that you're teaching us truth to equip us to reassure us, to encourage us, to promise us the resources that we too may know to be the people you've called us to be and to do the things you've called us to do. Thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.